get we're right here right before one o'clock so uh, we'll get started here in just uh, a few minutes i've got a uh, my cameraman today is my my senior graduating senior this year he's uh since he's doing homeschool and stuff he'll he'll be my cameraman and i got my uh, other helper my daughter over here as well just in case i need anything they'll be able to help me throughout the throughout the event so we'll get busy here in just a couple of minutes and you should see like chats coming through and stuff like that so and occasionally if you see a question that somebody's not answering or it comes through just to ask me the question and then that way I can answer it for them. What time do you have? Abby, you know what time it is, girl? 12.59. All right, 12.59. We got what, about one more minute and I'll get started. And for those of you that are kind of tuning in at this point in time, I just kind of remind you that uh, you know, we're, we're doing all this out live in, in the air, in the in midst of everything else. So uh, just kind of bear with us. There's sometimes a little bit of background noise at times. Uh, just depends on what's going on. Uh, we're, uh, uh, the other thing is, is that we do have uh, horticulture agents and specialists from across the state. Uh, they are online on the chat as well. So if you ask questions, um, if my cameraman sees one and he says it, I'll answer it right then and there. Otherwise, uh, some of our horde agents from across the state uh, will be answering questions as we go along. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a few things today when it comes to mowing your lawn, you know, what the benefits of it is and, and why we do that. Uh, also talk a little bit about fertilizing. Those are some of the things that are, are processes we have to do to our lawns uh, just to maintain them properly. And, and there's a lot of, large part of it, it's very beneficial to our lawns. Uh, the mowing aspect, a lot of people, you know, they, they have different style mowers. Uh, we have like the one I have here at my house, it's, it's a mulching mower. And uh, what that does is that cuts those blades off and it cuts it into small pieces and it distributes it back into the ground, into the soil. And that actually becomes nutrients uh, for the plants at a later time. So if you think about from a fertilization perspective, that actually reduces fertilization uh, when, it, when it comes down to, you know, you're putting nutrients back into the soil. Um, so with mulching mowers, since it does cut up those blades uh, quite regularly, uh, quite small, uh, you've got to look at, you know, how does it do that? Basically, it takes those leaves, it sucks them up in there, and it cuts them uh, several times and then distributes them down. And what I always like to do, you know, because some of the grasses are different um, as far as their mowing heights, when it depends, you know, like if you have Bermuda grasses, you may have to mow a little higher. And a lot of that information is on our Aggie Turf website. But like for my grass, I like tall grass. I like a good root system. So when I mow high, it's to develop a good root system. And I have my mower, and don't measure it on the concrete. You gotta do it out in the lawn. That way you get a good measurement. And I know that my blades is right here close to the bottom of the lip of that mower. And I'm ratted about probably three and a half inches on mine. And that's a good way to determine, you know, how, how deep are you, oh, how much, how, what is the, how high are you mowing, basically. Um, so, and you can go up to about four inches uh, as far as a St. Augustine grass is concerned. Uh, when you get into some of the other grasses, uh, they don't like it mowed as high. So you have to uh, make that adjustment with your mower. And some of your hybrid Bermuda grasses, especially like Tifway 419 and some of the other ones, like to be mowed much uh, um, much lower. In fact, sometimes you may have to switch from a, a rotary type mower like the one I have here, or even to a real mower, which is our, our EEL. Um, that was one thing my cameraman saw in a store one day and said, Dad, what is that? It's a it's cool thing. It's a, it's a real mower. You got to push it. So anyway, you have, of course, the mulching type mower. Since it, it does have the benefit of cutting off that leaf blade, what you have to be careful of, you don't want to cut off any more than one third of the leaf material that's already present. Now, it's easy to do that 
with a mulching mower. It's harder to do it with a regular mower that doesn't mulch the blades up because you may be cutting off too much leaf material that doesn't get broken down. There's two ways you can do that. If you have a side eject mower, you can actually go back over the leaf blades that get ejected. Um, or you can actually do another little trick where you raise the mower up in the front higher than the, than the back. And what it does is that cuts off a smaller amount the first pass as the, as the blade goes around. And as the back of the mower comes back, it cuts it a little, little deeper. So that gives it smaller pieces to go down into the, into the grass. You can't really do that with riding mowers because some of them just have a lever adjustment. So it's a little harder from that perspective. I always tell people too that one of the best things you can do is to mow in different directions. And for years I've had the pleasure of having two different lawn mowers. Both my kids have always been uh, very active in, in helping us mow the lawn and do things. And so they always go in different directions. Um, when I come home some, or when I'm here and I get to do it sometimes, I I like to do designs in my yard and mow different directions and crisscrosses, right? Yep. My daughter knows exactly. She came home one day and I had crisscrosses in the lawn and all kinds of stuff. Why do I do that? Well, number one, mowing in a different direction kind of promotes grass growth to kind of get through the bottom. Uh, if you keep going in one direction, the grass tends to lay down in one direction and it gets compaction from the soil from the mower from the uh, from the uh, wheels of the mower just the weight of even a small lawnmower like this if you continue to go over the, the same path over and over again that'll cause compaction which inhibits root growth and things like that so back to the mower so mowers are great uh, they help really stimulate the grass growth it's best to mow often and uh, at my house, so we can keep weeds down, so we can keep the grass growing well about every three days when we mow our lawn. And uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's something that we do in our, in our family, and we try to keep the weed down. When the thing with weeds is if you have grassy weeds especially, if you constantly mow, they, those weeds never have a chance to put out a seed head. And so if you're constantly cutting that grass off where it doesn't get that seed head, then it won't repopulate in your yard. One of the things I tortured my kids about many years ago is if I, they ever had a weed that had a seed head on it, they were to go out and pluck the weed, the seed head off the weed before they mowed. Maybe it's a form of torture, but I don't think so. I, don't, I didn't have a lot of weeds for a long time because we did that the right way. So that's one thing that you kind of can do is just mow more often. You can cut down on those weeds. And that also limits the amount of chemicals you put into your lawn. The other thing that you can think about, you know, as far as mower, uh, mowers are concerned, make sure your blades are nice and sharp. The sharper they are, the cleaner the cut, the less water that is lost from the leaves. Okay, and the, one of the things I always like to ask whenever I do classes on turf grass is, I ask the crowd, you know, how much water does turf, turf grass require per week during the growing season? And that is basically one inch per week during the growing season. So when does that growing season start? Uh, a lot of the recommendations are when you have to mow two times, almost two times a week, or after the second cutting of the year. And I think those are pretty close, but I always like to say, when you start having to mow two times a week, that's, the, that's when grass is really actively growing. And so what I'm gonna kind of transition into now is a little bit about fertilization as well. Because uh, fertilizing is an important process to help spur growth. There's times where fertilization needs to be uh, selective in how you do it, um, or why you do it, or what type of products to use. Um, right now is a good time to fertilize. Uh, we, in our area, in Montgomery County area, we, I like to say that after April 1st is a good time to do that because that's when grass is really starting to grow. Uh, when you go down into like uh, Corpus Christi or South Texas area, uh, it's probably even early March. It just depends on the weather, it depends on that grass. Um, so from year to year that can change as well just due to weather variations and you know you may get late cold fronts that may slow the grass down or something like that. And we always get a th you know get people say well we, what fertilizer do I use? There's so many choices, there's so many things out there. Um, one of the things that we recommend is going to the soil testing 
getting soil tests done, okay? Soiltesting.tamu.edu. You can actually uh, go on there and print out a form to get a sample, to get the, to shows you how to take a sample, where to send it, and if it's about $12, I think, for the, the routine sample. You take that and send that off to College Station, to the laboratory there, within about a week or two, they'll send you results of your sample. Um, and, and what that does, that'll let you know where the nutrients are in your soil or how much nutrient you actually do have. So it could provide an even more detailed approach to nutrients for your lawn. So soiltesting.tamu.edu, that's probably one of the first things you should do. Uh, even though we do have general recommendations when it comes to uh, soil fertility, uh, it's really best to just get a soil, tample, a soil sample test done uh, up front. So with general recommendations, uh, like for our area here, here in Montgomery County, we look at about a 3-1-2 ratio. I don't want to go a whole lot into, you know, how do we figure all that anything, or figure out, you know, how much of that fertilizer or anything else. There are actually, um, if you go to the soiltesting.tamu.edu website, they actually do have some pages back uh, on the bottom of the page and you can go and look for calculators where you can plug in your soil test results it'll tell you exactly how much of what fertilizer it even help you select fertilizers based on your area so I just want to go into more of the details somebody said how often should you soil test every two to three years um, that's a that's a because most of the time when you have especially if you have mulching mowers so soil testing about every two to three years mulching mowers or if you're adding nutrients back into the soil it will help as far as changing the amount of nutrients that you need thank you sir and yes another question what precautions if there are any should we take when fertilizing with pets or livestock what precautions should we take when fertilizing pets or livestock? Um, you know, fertilization is really, you know, it, it, it's, it's not, it's more, it's more the time when we talk about precautions, it's more in the line with chemicals. Uh, when you talk about maybe weed and feeds or other products of that nature, um, the whole thing is, is if you have a product that you're putting out, you know, I would suggest maybe uh, later in the afternoon or evening, only do one side of the yard or, you know, maybe do the front, maybe not the back. Just being able to move it around to where maybe you feel more comfortable with the decision you're making uh, as the applicator. Uh, if you don't really want your pets running through something because you think it may harm them or you feel that it may harm them, you can definitely, you know, fertilize the backyard one day. That way you can take your pet out in the front yard. Um, and same thing with maybe in the pastures as well. Uh, pastures not so, are, are not as, uh, not kind of my realm as far as what, what I deal with, so it's more in the lot of homeowners. I hope that answers the question. All right, so moving right along, we're talking about fertilization and, um, you know, how, how do you do that? You know, like I said, get, get that soil test done. Go onto that website there. You can look at those calculators uh, that are at the bottom of that page. You can get that, that link. You get that soil test done, and then you kind of know where you stand as far as uh, fertilization. Um, I'm kind of a little different the way I do things. Since I use a mulching mower, I'm constantly putting nutrients back into my lawn. I don't ever fertilize, uh, and that's that's I just don't. That's that's the way I do it. I save myself a little bit of money, and I keep I mow constantly and consistently. Of course, one of the benefits of living up here in Montgomery County is we get about 48 to 52 inches of rain fall a year. So I have adequate moisture a lot of times, uh, you know, many parts of the year. There's only a few times where I've had to uh, water, uh, just to supplemental water my lawn just to make sure it gets, stays going. Uh, so different parts of the world, I know down in Corpus Christi area where I'm originally from, you only get about you know, 18 to 25 inches of rain a year. Uh, sometimes more or less, just depending, and sometimes it's all at one time. So you have to you have to supplemental water more often down in those areas. But you know, through the process of what we're doing um, with fertilization, you can kind of control your growth of your grass. That way, maybe you don't mow as often because of different things. Yes. Um, there's been multiple requests about talking about brown patch. Multiple requests talking about brown patch. In fact, I'll, I love, brown patch is a fungus 
that gets in, that's in, already present. It's always there. Brown patch, it's AKA also called large patch. Um, one thing that you have to be careful of, if you've had it or if you've ever had it, it can be increased as far as its potential and its severity by over fertilizing with high nitrogen fertilizers. So you have to be careful with that. It's also with most diseases and fun in funguses in, in lawns, it's the problems are exhibited or amplified because of overwatering, over fertilization, and possibly even um, too many chemicals in the lawn period. Sometimes we tend to want to do more because we want quicker results. We have to be careful about those things. The best thing that you can do when you have experienced brown patch or AKA large patch um, is to let those areas dry out. Make sure that you're watering at the appropriate times. Um, you know, when we start in the spring, grass is growing very slow. So applying a fertilizer at that time, especially when brown patch is more prevalent, will only kind of like, in the way I like to describe it, it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. So you don't want to fertilize at certain times. That way, you, that way you wait a little bit longer until it dries out, until it heats up enough to where that grass is growing. Um, most of the time too, a, br a brown patch, AKA large patch, is also in low-lying areas. So you may have areas that hold more moisture. So you may want to go back and fill those in, maybe put some sandy loam or some compost, something to help the drainage or help that water not stand in those areas. The longer it stays moist, the more problems you do have. I hope that answers your question. If not, I know one of our uh, other horde agents and everything may help do that. All right. So uh, with, uh, with your soil, once you get a soil test and everything, you'll find out, okay, you know, this is the type of product I'm gonna use. One of the important things, and I, and I just recently saw a house that, where they had misapplied their fertilizer. You could see the dark green and a lime green stripe throughout the yard. And they, one thing they did is they went basically forward and back, forward and back, but they didn't have good overlap. So how do you keep that from happening? So. Being the Aggie that I am, I decided to use something, and it's just a wide extension cord to kind of show, you know, that this whole, whole space here might be your yard. If you travel one direction, okay, you have your coverage, and you take the, and this is where you actually take the whole amount that you're going to apply once you kind of run through all the tests and, and find out what kind of soil, uh, what kind of soil test, you know, what kind of your nutrients and everything you need. Once you have that, then you'll split that product basically in half or even choke down your, uh, your spreader to where you go half of your product in, uh, in one direction. If let's say you need five pounds on your front yard that's, a, you know, that's 480 square feet or whatever it may be, you would cut it into two and a half pounds in one direction and then go back and apply the other two and a half pounds in the other direction, that way you have full coverage in that area. And that way you don't end up with these big old stripes or striations in your lawn. Uh, we always have, you know, <laughs> from year to year, you know, you have uh, some products that have, uh, that you can use, you know, weed and feeds or whatever else that people use. Um, it's very, you, can, you should be very cautious about those types of products because some of them do damage trees. And uh, you really need to read labels carefully uh, so that tells you where not to apply, how to apply, when to apply. And in most areas, those the timing of the, and the application of those products is very different. Pre-emergence are typically put out when it's very cold or still cold in the environment. And then fertilization takes place much later. For instance, in our area, for a, a pre-emergent herbicide should be put out sometime in late January, early February. And then fertilization doesn't take place until April. So applying just a one-shot product is sometimes not the best scenario. But once you do a soil test and everything, you can kind of figure out what the best thing is for you and your situation. So... We talked a little bit about soil testing. Of course, there's all different types of, 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 of application equipment. You've got little handheld equipment that you can do, little whirly birds. Uh, just be careful that, you know, uh, I've, I've always seen one of the things where people are putting out some kind of uh, insecticide or something with these products um, and they're walking out in their bare feet. Make sure you use good judgment of what you're doing. Um, 
you know, these have a swath or a path at which they spread things out. You also have drop spreaders, which drop product out. You know, check the labels on those products. Make sure that the, you know, you use the recommended uh, amount of product for your lawn. And like I said, a lot of that can be done uh, just, you know, just through going for the, getting a soil test done and uh, finding out what kind, of, uh, what kind of fertilizer you need for your lawn. Now, I hope this has been informative for all of you. Like I said, we have uh, horticulture agents from across the state online right now answering questions for you. Uh, don't forget, you can go to the soiltesting.tamu.edu. That will get you to the information you need to get a soil test performed for your lawn. That way you know exactly what fertilizer you need. Also, there's another, another one here. If you need any or have any of the informa information that you want regarding horticulture, our Aggie Turf uh, website, aggieturf.tamu.edu, if you want to know a little bit more about Bermuda grasses for our, your area or for the state, as well as St. Augustine grass and zoysia and some of the other grass varieties that are out there. I hope this helps everybody. I'll take maybe a couple of questions if anybody has some. Okay. No, all good. Okay. I hope this kind of clarifies some of the things. Like I said, again, just to make sure, you know, you raise that mower height up. Oh, in fact, you know what? I will go over one more thing. And especially since this is recorded, you'll be able to go back and play this back. But on these mulching mowers or most of these mowers, uh, what you can do is you can ramp up, and I always call it ramping up, is that starting early in the spring, you start low, and I'm not talking about scalping, because scalping, if you go too low, will actually damage the grass. So you wanna set it maybe, you know, about, like for me, I set it at about two to two and a half inches, and as it gets hotter during, into the spring and into the summer, I raise up that mower up more, higher and higher. As you ramp up, and you raise that leaf blade up, it creates more uh, root system to help with droughts and uh, keep that grass going much longer. And that goes with most of your grasses. Uh, you just have to be careful with some of the other ones like uh, some of the Bermuda grasses because if they get too leafy and you cut too much of the leaf off, you'll actually kill it. So just make small increments. Just give a brief uh, explanation about top dressing. A brief explanation about top dressing, yes. Okay, that is one of those things. Okay, timing of a top dressing is very important. Make sure when it's done, and t the timing I'm going to talk about first, and then I'll talk about the products. Timing, make sure you have at least four to six weeks before or after a stress occurs before you do it. So last frost dates, wait four to six weeks. Make sure that grass is actively growing and not under stress before you get to the middle of the summer, Bef you know, before you start getting 100 degree temperatures. Make sure you have enough time for cool weather. Like now, grass is growing actively. Now's a good time to do it. You can also do it in the fall with the same concept. Make sure you have about four to six weeks for that grass to kind of recover. And because basically once you start putting an amendment or a top dressing over that area, it kind of stresses the grass out. It kind of slows it down. So what to use? Uh, in areas where you have real heavy clay soils, you may want to think about something like compost. Uh, get you know some kind of real good compost. You also may want to think about maybe even sandy loams to help with drainage. So those are some of the things that you can do and the timing that you can do with top dressing. Okay. Got another question? I have a couple questions about um, aeration. A couple questions um, about aeration. Any recommendations? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, recommendations on aeration. Worth using a plug aerator in mm -hmm. your yard. Any benefits? Okay. Man, we're doing a whole class today just on turf, I think. I was just going to cover two things, but hey, let's do the rest of it. Why not? I love doing it. So when it comes to aeration, same kind of principles as I talk about when I, about top dressing four to six weeks before a stress occurs or before after a stress occurs. So the timing is very similar. A plug aerator is much more beneficial from the standpoint that when it pulls a plug out, it'll pull about a four to six inch plug of soil out of the ground and then left is a hole. If you used it to spike aerator, what tends to happen is you have two spikes. They actually force the soil together 
And then what happens is when the soul actually will expand and it goes back to the way it was. So having a core aerator is much more beneficial. It adds oxygen and allows you to even do some top dressing after a core aeration to help uh, get in more organic matter or things of that nature. Um, as far as, you know, and like I said, timing, four to six weeks before or after, you know, make sure you got a good leeway there so that grass can recover before it goes into a stress or before it, you know, and the soil will come out after a stress. So top dressing, that's a good benefit. Now, how often? Um, I have some people that, that want to do it every year and they do a top dressing of, you know, like a quarter inch. Uh, don't, that, that's one of the things you have to be careful of. You don't ever want to put too much. A half inch is about as good as you can get, as for, whether it's a soil or whether it's a compost. Um, every, you know, if you have a real heavy clay soil, every two to three years. If you have real sandy soils, I would stick with more of a compost um, and then do that, you know, every couple of years as well. That may help at least in sandier soils. And that may help at least as far as moisture retention. And of course, when you do that, you're adding a lot of nutrients into your soil. So thus reducing the fertilizer and everything you need. Okay. Hopefully that answers your question. All right. So just remember, mow often, and, and that'll help reduce those weeds. Uh, there are times, you know, weeds can be a problem. I suggest that, you know, uh, when you uh, have some weed problems, we all do. Uh, occasionally, you know, it's good to... Uh, get a weed sample, take some good photos of it, send it to your county extension agent in your area, I have them identify it and we can offer recommendations as far as uh, different types of active ingredients that work on those, uh, those types of weeds. Um, you know, uh, weeds are also indicators of things that are going on in your lawn. Um, for instance, uh, dollar weed, dollar weed is a very good indicator that soil, that you have very, very wet areas. Um, if you have what they call wavy basket grass, that's a very good indicator that you have a lot of shade. Uh, and sometimes St. Augustine uh, is, you know, can't grow in those shady areas. In fact, that's, a, that's another little topic off this that we can cover real quick. When you have shady areas, make sure you take that mower and instead of, let's say you mow your yard at about three inches, make sure you take that mower and raise it up a full inch in shaded areas. Uh, that will allow those leaves to capture more sunlight and give them more energy. You also have to reduce your fertilization in shady areas and also reduce your water in those areas. Um, that, you know, grass that grows slowly, especially with the shade, does not like a lot of water and does not like a lot of fertilization. So raise the mower up an inch, less fertilization, and less water. The other thing you can do is you can also uh, thin out your tree canopies or allow more sunlight uh, penetration to the lawn. Okay, anything else? Okay, that's it. Great. I know we have a lot of master gardeners and everything in different counties around the state. Uh, they have help lines and help desks in, in different areas. We had, they have specialists and everything that, uh, in fact, I know I've got about five or six of my turf grass specialists here in Montgomery County that can help answer questions. Um, so, you know, look for your counties, uh, extension offices, see if you have master garden organizations out there that, uh, that have uh, people that can help you as well as the agents. Uh, if, you know, just remember aggieturf.tamu.edu if you want some turf grass information. Uh, and then soil testing.tamu.edu for your uh, soil tests. Thank you, and uh, we appreciate coming and visiting with us and being with us today. Hopefully, this helps you. And uh, if you have any questions, let us know. That's what uh, we are here to do: is we are here to help you and improve your life, and hopefully improve your lawn along the way. Thank you.